If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in verse 19. John chapter 12, verse 19. The Bible says, The the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came before to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered and said and answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto, etern- unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also my servant be. If, my, if, my, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then there then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people therefore that stood by heard it and said it is thunder and said that it thundered. And others says an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. I'd like to preach the Lord being my helper this morning on the thought, How are you lifting up Christ? Dear Lord, we thank You and praise You for another opportunity to be in Your house this morning. We thank You for a good building to meet out of the cold. Lord, we thank You for each one that's here and praise You and honor You. Lord, we know by divine appointment that You sent them this way, Lord, and that uh, through Your Word and Your power, You will draw men unto Yourself. Lord, we pray that You would bless. We pray that You would bless everyone here this morning. Give us a joyful time in Your Word. We be faithful to praise you for it, for it's in Christ's name we do ask. Amen. Now, um, fairly long reading, but I felt like it was necessary to get the whole thought. And, and what I found in studying this is I probably don't lift up Jesus enough. And if you look at every day and every experience that you have, you have a means to lift up the Lord Jesus. You, you have a way. Now, nine times out of ten, we don't take it, but in every way and in every situation, there is a way to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, go back to verse 19. The Bible says, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? In other words, they are saying, We're not making any progress. Their their desire and their hope was to bring Jesus down and that His ministry be stopped. But instead, it was growing every day. He says, don't you see that we're not... You know what? Uh, Sometimes we get the idea that we're not prevailing anything. That's right. But we are. Uh, Sometimes we get the idea, hey, it's time to quit. It's time to do something else. But don't do that. You're not a Pharisee. You're a believer. So something is being accomplished even when we can't see it. So the Pharisees, which was a rare thing for them, the Pharisees were about ready to quit. And uh, verse 20 says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship the feast. Now, I want you to get this because the Greeks were not believers. The Greeks were heathen, even though all the Greek gods that are still historical presently today, you can study who they worship even now, and the filth that was all around Athens and the idolatry that there that, that was always there, and those individual pure idolaters came along and they wanted to see Jesus. You know what? It's an unusual 
thing to me. We live in a day and age where very few people want to see Jesus. Right. Now, they might want to see a little object that they call Jesus. They might want to see a little picture that they are a long haired hippie that they say, oh, this is Jesus. Or they might want to see a little baby in a manger. This is time to, it, it's, it, it's the time of the big year where they have the huge Christ mass and every person in the country is going to become Catholic for two days. But, you know what? That's not Jesus. Amen. They wanted to come to see the living Son of God and observe Him. You know what? That's not natural for a Greek man to want. You know what? It's not a natural desire even for us to be here. If you wanted to be here this morning, it's because of the goodness of God. That's not a natural move. So you find a very unusual situation when the Greeks... Uh, the heathen, the, the abject heathen, are moved and they desire to see Jesus. Verse 21, the same therefore, the same came there to Philip. Now why did they, they go to Philip? Well you know what? Philip was a Greek. In other words, an individual of that nation had already been saved. He, he'd been saved out of idolatry. He'd been saved out of, uh, out of that heathen worship. And you know what? Somehow he was getting word back home to say, Hey, this man is different. This is not a regular Jew. This is not a, this is not a regular preacher. There's something different about this man. You know what? Uh, I really believe sometimes if we tell somebody what we really felt about the Lord Jesus, then things would change, don't Amen. you? Amen. Yeah. See, they, 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 Philip was excited, and he was no doubt, maybe he was writing letters back home or he was sending word somehow, but they knew Philip, and they knew Philip had been converted. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. In other words, they tell this people are wanting to see you. Heathen people, Greeks, are wanting to see you. You know what? When you come to church, do you really come because you want to see Jesus? And I know we can't see Him fleshly, but we can see Him of our spirit. Amen. If He's being preached, now, if you go somewhere where He's not being preached, you ain't going to see nothing but maybe a little bit of emotionalism. But if you, if you go in where the Lord is being preached, you can see Him in the Spirit. And, and, and these people, they had a desire. They wanted to see Jesus. Greek, even people that were idolaters in every way, they wanted to see Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. Verse 23, And Jesus answered, and say, answered them, saying, He did not say yes or no to the question about the Greeks. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You know, uh, what a wonderful thing when the hour has come. That the, you know what? When we come to worship here in the house of the Lord, it's the, it's the hour when the Lord should be glorified. That means illuminated. That means lifted up. That means so people can yeah. see even a little bit better. And He's saying, listen, it's time for me to be glorified. And so in a way, He was answering because He's like, yeah, I'm fixing to be really be able to be seen. I'm fixing really that everybody can see me. I'm fixing to be in a situation where I'm lifted up. And so he was saying yes in that sense that I am going to be seen. I'm going to be visible at that point to just about everyone. Verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, I'll, uh, I'll, let you, I'll say this. Uh, we spend a lot of time abiding alone. And I don't, need, I don't mean to stay in by yourself. But we do so little sacrifice, self-sacrificing. You, you ever wonder why there's no progress in the church, at least visually, that we can see? Well, a lot of times we're being selfish. We're guarding ourselves. Because you know what? The Lord Jesus had to die for sacrifice. And, and, and sometimes we have to sacrifice things. If we want the gospel to be furthered, you may have to tighten your belt a little bit. In other words, instead of eating 50 helpings, eat 20 and, and tighten your belt and move on. I've been reading a, a book about a missionary uh, this week. And in fact, when he died, he weighed 99 pounds. And the reason he did, he spent, he spent two and a half years walking through the continent of Africa 
just looking for someone that would listen to the gospel. And in the process, he had very little to eat. He, most of the time he was starving to death, but he was driven by the thought that these heathen people need to hear about Jesus. And he, and he went on. So sometimes we have to be self-sacrificing if we want the gospel to be further. Verse 26, If any man serve me, let him follow me. Now, don't say that you're a servant of Christ because uh, when it says serve me, that doesn't mean just, that means servant, that means slave. If any man wants to be my slave, let him follow me. You know, you know when, most of the time when we say, well, I want to serve Jesus, we don't mean it. Uh, remember Mary and Martha, the two sisters? Martha was tore up about the house being messed up. And Mary was at the feet of Jesus. So even though Martha was busy and doing a lot of work, who was the true servant? Mary was. Because see, a servant sits at the feet of, uh, of the master just waiting for him to say something. Right. And he says, get up and go. They're gone. But most of the time they're just listening and looking and trying to hear what's being said. And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to be like that. There at the feet of Jesus. And He says, uh, do you want to be my servant? And it ought to be that our, our, our cry for the whole group would be, yes, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where, I, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. In other words, he understood the plan of God. And yeah, you know what? He wasn't looking forward to being mercilessly beaten. He wasn't looking forward to having the crown of thorns crammed on his head. He wasn't being, he wasn't looking forward to having, having the stakes grow through his hands. He wasn't looking forward to that. But he said, that's why I came. That, that's the bird. You know what? He came to be the sacrificial lamb for His people. That's why He came. He, yes, He came to start the church. And yes, He came to teach. But His main purpose is to be the sacrifice for our sins. He said, this is why I came. And you know, uh, so He said, you know, certainly I can't step aside from the very duty that I, that I was created to accomplish. And He didn't. He went forward with it. Verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore stood by and heard it and said it thundered. Now, you know, that sounds pretty good, but what, you know what was really happening? They were denying God. Because he says, this is my remember when after his baptismal service, he said, This is my beloved son, and who I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Mm -hmm. right. Very, 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 very same event. This time he says, Yes, I have, and I will glorify thee. Uh, man, that's thunder. You know what? If, some, if there was a voice from heaven saying, huh, I will glorify thee, you know what? A lot of us would write it off to thunder too. And you know why? This is the reason why. If you acknowledge that as a voice from God, then you're accountable to God. You know, whether you want to be or not this morning, you're accountable to the Creator. Every decision you make, you're accountable to. I, I, that's pretty humbling, isn't it? And, and we, we all... We all want to write it off out there, you know. Well, that's just how it is. Listen, don't ever blame God's sovereignty for your accountability because you're still accountable to Him. Good decisions, bad decisions. Good things, bad things. Come to the house of God and lay now. Whatever you choose to do, you're accountable. And so then we as the Lord's people don't write off His... Don't write off in any way because he says this he is my son and, and they said oh man it just thundered a big one verse 
The second part of verse 29. Others said an angel spake to him. Now, the second part still sounds pretty good, but they still don't give God the credence. One of them said it's thunder or the natural elements. One of them said, well, yeah, it is an angel, but nobody said that's God Almighty speaking. That's Jehovah God. That's the unspeakable name of God. He said this is his man. Nobody acknowledged it in any way. We as the Lord's people need to get used to saying, well, that was God. Verse 30. And Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. In other words, uh, Jesus didn't, didn't need to hear, uh, Son, I'm with you. And the reason we didn't need to hear it, they're all three one anyway, right? Mm -hmm. he, he knew the mind of the Father, and the Father knew His mind, and the Holy Ghost knew both their minds. But came for a testimony very, the very voice of God. And it was ignored. Right. You know, have you ever wondered, and I, I catch myself, and that's why I frequently quote making calling an election sure. Because uh, there's a hairline step breath difference between being religious and being saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, a lot of people die in their own religion, don't they? Uh, ne never knowing the kindness of the Father, never knowing the goodness and the preciousness of real salvation. And, and the reason why, just like here, we, we play it off to other excuses. Oh, but, but what it really is when it comes down to it is the very voice of God speaking. Verse 21, Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, we know that in a very short order, 48 hours or less, he was lifted up. Now, uh, that lifting up was a very painful event. The crucifixion was gruesome. It was uh, it's horrific. Uh, you know, if you've never seen anybody die by trauma, you probably need to. Uh, I've seen three or four people that they just died because of injuries in a car accident. And it's gruesome. Uh, things that stick with me the rest of my life. But that's nothing in comparing to the cruelty of a Roman cross being raised up. And literally the goal wasn't blood. But now he died of blood loss. But the goal of crucifixion was suffocation. It wasn't, because most people, many of them were just tied up there. The, 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 the nailing of the cross was reserved for the worst of the worst. And so that's how, they, that's how they viewed our Lord Jesus, that He was the worst of the worst. And, and, and so He said, if I be lifted up, if I'm raised up, all will be well. If I'm lifted up. Now, most certainly He was, and He was, he was lifted up in a way that He would be visible. He was lifted up in a way that He would be between earth and heaven. He was lifted up. Now, to get there was a very painful process. And you know what? We need to quit thinking less. We need to start thinking less and less about ourselves and more and more about how are we lifting up Jesus. What are we doing to raise the banner? What are we doing to be sure that He's seen by the people that know us and that are around us on a routine basis? Because that is the very reason that we came. Now, I want you to look over me in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 7. While you turn it there, I will make a reference to a verse. I think it's in, uh, in the book of uh, 1 Peter. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but he says, And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. <laughs> and, and so I, I ask you, what have you done this week or the week you just left behind? What did you do last week to lift up Jesus. What did you do to say, hey, the Creator, the Son of God, is living within me? 
What did you do last week to say, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm interested in your never dying soul. I'd love to tell you about the name of Jesus. I'd love to tell you about His cleansing blood. I'd love to tell you uh, what He did for me. Did you have a few moments? See, if I be... You know why, you know, and I certainly understand election, but you know why we don't see many people saved? Don't blame it just on... And, and we are. I believe we're in the gleaning period. But a lot of it is, is our fault. In a, he'll give somebody to spread the gospel, but why not you? Yeah. You know what? It shouldn't matter. You know what? What I have found in, in reading from the story of Ruth, the gleaners have to work twice as hard to get less. <laughs> right? And, and, and so, we as Lord's people, what we need to be doing is working twice as hard. So, uh, continuing the fight, keep going. Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 51. Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 51. Uh, Stephen, serving the Lord right up to the end, uh, we're, we're, we're believing Stephen was a preacher, but we do know for sure this, that he was the head deacon. He was the first deacon. And he had, and he, he, you know what? What most of would say, man, that's women's work. Well, what was Stephen's job? Serving the tables down at the house of God. Right. And the reason was so, so that the what they considered the man of God to be about the father's business. So they appointed seven. And Stephen was oh, was the was the chief one. You know what? I don't think Stephen ever thought. You know what? I'm too good to wait tables. I don't think Stephen ever grumbled about having to do the dishes. You know, Martha was grumbling about it, wasn't she? You know, when you feed people, the natural result is you want dishes to wash. Right? Mm -hmm. Stephen wasn't that kind of man. But when he did get an opportunity, when he had time to leave the kitchen and he was out doing something else, he still proclaimed the Word of God. Now, he ended up in a, in a difficult situation because of that, but he would not compromise. Now, another thing that we find today, that the reason we don't get it out quite as good as we used to, is compromise. Compromise. Well, you know... <laughs> It is 2017, and that's kind of old fogey wogey stuff. Well, you know, the Bible says that it's I'm the Lord, I change not. And if we're His bride, then we're not going to either. Right? And so we see then as the Lord's people that we simply just need to continue serving the Lord Jesus. We need to continue just like Stephen did up to the end. So we find him in Acts 7, verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Now he hits them in two different ways. A lot of people miss this. Uh, first of all, he's saying you stiff-necked. A stiff-necked horse will not follow you when you pull. They, they, they pull against you. When you say, I want to go this way, they say no. He was saying, you do not follow God. You stiff-necked. And the second thing he said, you're uncircumcised in heart. That means the toughness is still there. That, mean, that means there's no softness about you. Me, in other words, he's saying you, you're lost. You, you, don't, you don't have, you don't understand who even who God is. And you know what? That's not popular preaching today. But, you know, sometimes what we need to hear is, listen, you need to be redeemed. You need to be saved. You need to be regenerated. That's what we as Lord's people sometimes just need to hear and quit trying to put something on it that's not. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Do you always resist the Holy Ghost? As your fathers did, so do ye. Now I'll give you two things to think about that. And I, I'm not sure that I understand everything that I should about this because I know God is sovereign. But I have to know if I believe all the Word of God to be inspired, and I do believe it is. There is a resistance to the Holy Ghost or He wouldn't have written it this way. Right. Now I will give you this. He was addressing lost people. And that may play a role to it too. But listen, just because God's sovereign don't mean you're a puppet on some strings. 
That's why there's different, different crowns to be had. You know, just because He tells you to go speak the word of truth to your neighbor and say, man, I'm not going to do that. You know what? He'll send somebody and somebody will be dispatched and somebody will be obedient and somebody will go tell the gospel to that young person and the Lord will save them, but you're the one that's missed out, not God. That's right. And so, can a saved person resist the Holy Ghost? Sure he can. Sure she can. We do it all the time. And, and, and so we see then that as Stephen is, is about ready to die, he says, you're just resisting the Holy Ghost. Verse 52, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which shewed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by the deposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut in their heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of different things about that. First of all, uh, it says that Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. His tank was on full that day. You know what? When you're in when you're in deep trouble and your tank's on full, you're still in good shape. Ready to go. Ready to go. Yeah. Uh, the thing of it is, and a lot of Baptists don't like this, we're not always full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you know, uh, women, and I mean it's bad ladies. Except my mother. Now my mother, if she has if it's the first notch past full, she'll make you go to come and sit and get her some gas. She she keeps it on full. But now, most of us, uh, every time I get in a car with Donna, she turns on the ignition, ding, and the gas is empty. Uh, uh, about two times I rode with it, but that didn't happen. And uh, that's where most of us abide, isn't it? Just on fumes. And you know, the reason why is this the Bible says this if you draw nine to me, I draw nine. But to draw nine to Him, you don't have to give some things up. To draw nine to Him, He has to become a priority. He has to become first and foremost. And so, most of us, if we get to where Stephen is, on fumes, you know what's going to happen? We're going to deny Him. We're, we're going to be like Peter and say, I don't even know who you're talking about. You know, you know what would be good this morning if every one of us would just get gassed up. Yeah. That that's what we need. So, so we find Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. He he was completely to the brim and full, and it gave him energy and spiritual strength for what he was about to face. And I also want you to see this: that he saw the Lord Jesus and God the Father. And we looked up there and saw him, and of course they already, you know, they got pointed what was going to happen. But once he seen the Lord God and His deity, he was gone, because no man can see God and live. But he looked up, and you know what? He's a spiritual man because things up there started looking better than things down here. You know what our problem is? We too, we too embraced with what things look like down here. You know, all, all we want is, you know, in the 70s when I was young, uh, those little uh, three bedroom bricks was everybody's idol. And, you know, you get in the day and you're like, I don't even know how people live in this thing. And you're never going to change your mind. But, you know, as uh, long as we're focused on that, we know there'll be much use to the things of God. Do we have to have a place to live? Sure, every one of us needs a place to live. Do we have to pay $150,000 in debt? No. See what I'm saying? And so we find that if Stephen is about to, to give up the ghost, that he sees the Father, he sees the Lord Jesus, and it's time for him to leave. Verse 56, And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, they weren't upset about him seeing into glory. 
What they were upset about was recognizing Jesus. Now, if they just said, oh, I see Jehovah God, they'd been okay with that. But see, that he said, I see, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. See, that he was saying again, you missed it. Jesus was the Son of God. And He's back where He's supposed to be. <clears throat> and they just couldn't stand it. And they began throwing the rocks. You know what? Uh, right now, for the moment, the rocks we get is mostly words. Saying, you're so stupid. I can't believe that you give 10 or 15% of your income to something that doesn't even exist. Why do you keep going to church? You're foolish. Now, I, I do say this. There's probably come a time when they get real again. Where uh, we'll be hiding the meat. I, I think that time's coming. But until, until then, we have this. But you know what? Uh, get filled up. Get gassed up. Because those days are coming. They're going to be a reality again, and we'll have to deal with it. So, uh, in, in, in his dying moments, he looked up and he, he seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58, and 58, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down. And cried with a loud voice, Lord lay, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I'll give you two things. And th 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 this is uh, bracing yourself up, by the way. This is one of the best examples in the, in the New Testament. Uh, he didn't get mad about it. In fact, at the very end, he was still concerned about the people that he was preaching to. You know what? Some people say I'm pretty direct in my preaching. Paul, Pete, uh, Stephen was too. The very same people who he, he had just said, you're stiff necked and hard hearted. As he's dying and they're killing him, he says, Lord, lay not this into the charge. See, he loved them. You know what? When you really love somebody, you will tell them the truth. And we need to understand and know that we're not always filled with the Holy Ghost. Sometimes we're running on fumes. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes we just, you know, uh, Matthew tells me a story right of him and Death of Mary. Uh, they, uh, they're traveling back this way. They're going through some big park or something. And Matthew's like me. Well, he's worse than me. He's cheap. And uh, he saw the gas going up. And uh, I ain't going to pay this for gas. Well, when he left the city, there wasn't going to be another city for about 100 miles. And, you know, uh, he's running on fumes. Now, God sustained them, and they came through it. But what was the motivation? And I'd be the same way, probably, like I said, he gets it from me. He didn't want to pay the price. Right? You know why you were running on fumes this morning? You don't want to pay the price. That's why we're running on feeding, isn't it? And, and, and so we see, we see then as the Lord's people, we need to be like Stephen and be dug in and be ready. Now I want to read very quickly one more uh, short uh, verses of Scripture from you and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be done. In the book of Daniel, I want to show you an Old Testament example. Uh, Daniel chapter number... Uh, Daniel chapter number 6. Daniel chapter number 6. In verse 8. Daniel chapter number 6. In verse 8. Now, O king, establish the decree. Now, you know this, and it was a, it was a work of Satan's men in that day to get Daniel out of the way. And, and, and their, their way was they had observed that Daniel was faithful in his prayer. Now, I'll ask you this and you answer this yourself. 
Uh, if they were looking for a loophole for you, would your prayer life be a loophole that they could find? If they were looking for a loophole for you, would reading that book be a loophole that they could find? In other words, they'll say, I know what we'll do. We'll make the King James illegal, and anybody that's caught reading one, well, they're out of here. Could they take you down for it? Except on Sunday. See, if you're not doing it at home, you're not doing it enough. Right? And, and so we then, as the Lord's people, certainly need to focus on that. And, and, and so uh, they wanted to get Daniel out of the way, and they observed in Daniel that his biggest consistency was this, and that was his prayer life. You know, well, what a wonderful testimony that that was the thing they could pick about Daniel and say, well, you know what? We do notice this. Every Three times a day he opens his east windows down toward Jerusalem and he gets down on his knees and he prays out to God. Let's use that against him. And they did. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous thing that he had that testimony. And, and, and you know what? If you have a good testimony... Yes, it's going to be used against you and, and you may lose a job or two over it and you may have a little problems over it, but God sustains. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius, sign the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in the chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled down upon his knee three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he did a time. Now, let me insert this. Don't get religious because the law changes. <laughs> because see, he didn't get all fancy and start praying because now it was illegal. He had done it before. Now, if you just want to look religious to the world, <laughs> I don't think God will sustain you in it. In other words, if he made it illegal... And then you just started doing it because it was illegal. He won't sustain you in that. But it was Daniel's character and his faithfulness. And he kept and he kept praying. And he kept praying. And you know the rest of the story God delivered him. We need to understand and know what your witness is. You need to understand and know the influence you have. And you need to be faithful in it. We don't need to give up. We don't need to stop. We need to continue to give praise and glory and honor to the Lord. Look for a means of testimony. In everything you do, in every routine basis, you look for something that you can name the name of Jesus. One time, and I can't even remember where I worked, but I think it was, I think it was uh, maybe at the hospital. And I got my lunch and I sat down and thanked the Lord for it. And somebody said, why do you always do that? And I said, because He gave it to me. See, one, and you know what? It wasn't long I was working somewhere else. But I've often thought, did that person remember that? And he may not have. It might have just been a flight of ideas and gone forever. But... He knows enough to ask. Right. <clears throat> so what about you? See, we as the Lord's people, we need to be consistent in our service to God. We need to be faithful. So have you lifted up the name of Jesus recently? What are you doing to lift Him up? On the workplace, what's, where you go? Are you different than anybody else? Is your language different? The things you say, the things you do? Ladies, do you know why your hair should be long? Gentlemen, do you know why yours should be? See, that's a testimony, isn't it? Because people will ask. People will ask. And so what's your testimony?